From the Cube Studios in Palo Alto and Boston, connecting with thought leaders all around the world, this is a Cube Conversation. Hi everyone, welcome to the Cube Conversation here in Palo Alto, California. I'm John Furrier, host of the Cube. We have a special content series called Leading with Observability. And this topic is keeping watch over microservices and containers with a great guest, Patrick Lynn, VP of Product Management for the Observability Products at Splunk. Patrick, great to see you. Thanks for coming on remotely. We're still in the pandemic, but thanks for coming on. Yeah, John, great to see you as well. Thanks for having me. So leading with observability, this is a big theme of our content series. Um, you know, managing end-to-end -end, end user experience was a great topic around how data can be used for user experience, but now underneath that layer, you have this whole <laughs> craziness of the rise of the container generation where containers are actually going mainstream and uh, Gartner will, will forecast anywhere from 30 to 40% of enterprises still yet um, haven't really adopted at full scale. And you got to keep watch over these. So, so what is what is the topic about keeping watch over microservices and containers? Because, you know, we know they're being deployed. Is it just watching them for watching's sake, or is there a specific reason? What's the theme here? Why this topic? Yeah. Well, I think I think containers um, are part of uh, the the entire kind of stack uh, of technology that's being deployed. Uh, in order to uh, develop uh, and ship software uh, more quickly, right? And and the fundamental reasons for that um, haven't changed, but they've uh, been greatly accelerated by um, the the, uh, the impact of uh, the pandemic, right? And so uh, I think for for the past few years uh, we've been talking about how um, you know software is eating the world, how it's become more and more important uh, that that companies go through the transformation uh, to be more more digital, right? Um, and and, and I think now uh, that is so patently obvious to everybody, right? When your only way of accessing your customer uh, and for the customer to access your, uh, your services is through a digital medium, right? Uh, the ability for um, your IT and dev uh, and DevOps teams to be able to deliver against uh, those requirements, uh, to deliver that flawless customer experience, um, to, to sort of you know, keep pace with the, the digital transformation and, and the cloud initiatives, right? Um, all of that is kind of coming um, as as one uh, one big wave, um, and so you know we see a lot of uh, organizations migrating uh, workloads to the cloud, refactoring uh, applications, um, you know, building new applications natively. And so when they do that, uh, oftentimes the uh, uh, infrastructure of choice uh, is containers, right? Because it's the thing uh, that keeps up with the the pace of the development. Um, it's uh, it's a much more uh, efficient use of underlying resources. It's uh, uh, you know, so it's all it's all kind of uh, you know, part of the overall uh, movement uh, that that we see. What is the what is the main driver for this use case, uh, microservices, and what where's the progress bar in your mind of the adoption and deployment of microservices, and what is the critical things that are that you guys are looking at that are important to monitor and observe and keep track of? Is it the status of the microservices? Is it the fact that they're being turned on and off? The state, not state? I mean, take us through some of the main drivers for why you guys are keeping an eye on the microservices component. Sure. Well, I think that you know, if we take a step back, the the reason that uh, people have moved towards microservices and containers fundamentally has to do with uh, the desire to be able to um, number one uh, develop and ship more quickly, right? And so if you can parallelize the development, have um, you know APIs as the interface between these services rather than having sort of one monolithic uh, code base, uh, you can evolve more quickly, right? Um, and uh, on top of that, right, uh, the the goal is to be able to deliver software that is able to scale um, as needed, right? And so uh, that that is a uh, part of uh, the equation as well. So when you sort of look at uh, at this, right, the the desire to be able to um, uh, iterate on your uh, uh, software and services more quickly, uh, to be able to scale um, infinitely, uh, staying uh, up and so on, right? Um, uh, that's all like a great reason to do it, but what uh, what happens uh, along uh, those lines, right? What, what comes with it um, is a few kind of additional layers of complexity because now uh, rather than have, you know, let's say an end tier app that you're watching over on some host that you could, you know, reboot when there's a problem, uh, now you have uh, tens, maybe hundreds of servers uh, running on top of uh, maybe hundreds, thousands, maybe tens of thousands of, of containers, right? Um, and so the complexity of that environment um, has grown uh, quite quite quickly, right? Um, and, and the fact that um, those containers may go away as you scale uh, the service up and down to meet demand um, also adds to that complexity, right? And, and so from 
uh, an observability perspective, uh, what you need to be able to do um, is a few things. One is you need to actually be um, tracking uh, this in enough detail and at a high enough resolution, right, in real time, uh, so that you know when things are coming in and out, right? Um, and, and that's been, you know, one of the, the more critical things uh, that we've built towards uh, as Splunk is that, that ability to watch over it um, in real time. But more important or just as important than that, right, is, is understanding the dependencies and the relationships between these different services, right? Um, and so that's one of the, the main things that we worked on here uh, is to make sure that uh, you can understand uh, the dependencies so that when there's an issue, um, you have a, a shot at actually uh, figuring out where the problem is coming from. Right, because of uh, the fact that there's so many different services and so many things that could be affecting the overall uh, user experience uh, when something goes wrong. Right? I think that's one of the most exciting areas right now in observability is this whole microservices container equation because a lot of actions being done there. There's a lot of complexity, but the upside, if you do it right, is significant. I think people generally are bought into that concept, um, Patrick, but I want to get your thoughts. I get this question a lot from executives and leaders, whether it's a cloud architect or a CXO. And the question is, what should I consider? What, what, should, what do I need to consider when deploying an observability solution? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question because uh, I think there are, there are obviously a lot of lot of considerations here, right? So I, I think one of the main ones, um, and, and this is something that I think is a, a pattern that that we uh, are pretty familiar with uh, in in the the sort of monitoring uh, and management tool world, right? Um, is that um, over time most enterprises have uh, gotten themselves a very large number of tools, right? The uh, one one for each part of uh, their their infrastructure uh, or their, their application stack and so on, right? Uh, and so uh, what you end up with is um, sprawl um, in the the monitoring tool set that you have, um, which creates um, not just sort of a you know certain amount of overhead, right, uh, in terms of the cost, but also complexity that gets in the way of actually um, figuring out where the problem is, right? Like uh, I I've been uh, you know looking at at uh, some of the tool sets that uh, some of our customers have pulled together. And you know, they, they have the ability to get information about um, everything, but it's not, um, it's not uh, kind of woven together in a useful way. Um, and, and it sort of gets in the way actually, uh, you know, having so many tools when you are actually uh, in the heat of the moment trying to figure something out, right? Um, it sort of harkens back to uh, the time when, you know, when you have an, an outage, um, you know, you have a con call with like a cast of thousands on it trying to figure out what's going on, right? Yeah. And each person comes to that with their own tool, with their own view, uh, without anything that ties that to what the others uh, are seeing, right? Um, and so that uh, that uh, need to be able to provide uh, sort of an integrated uh, tool set uh, with a consistent uh, interface uh, across infrastructure, across the application, across what the user experiences, um, and across the different data types, right? The metrics, the traces, the logs, right? Fundamentally, I think that ability to kind of easily correlate uh, the data across it and get to the right insight, um, uh, we think that's a super, super important thing. Yeah, and I think what that points out, I mean, I always said, don't be a fool with a tool. And if you have too many tools, you have a tool yeah. shed and there are too many tools everywhere. Um, yeah. And and that's kind of a, a trend. And tools are great when you need tools, right? To do things. But when you have Absolutely. too many, when you have a data model where essentially what you're saying is a platform is the trend because weaving stuff together, you need to have a data control plane. You need to have data visualization. You need to have these things for understanding the success there. So really yeah. it's a platform, but Platforms also have tools as well. So tools are features of a platform, yeah. if I get what you're saying, right? Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, so I, I think that um, there's one part of this, which is uh, you need to be able to, um, you know, if I if I start from the user point of view, right? Uh, what you want is a a consistent and coherent set of workflows for the people who are trying to actually uh, do the work, right? You you don't want them to uh, have to uh, deal with the impedance mismatches across different tools that exist based on, um, you know, whatever, even the language that they use, but how they bring the data in and how it's being processed, right? Uh, you go down one layer from that, um, you you sort of want to make sure that uh, what they're working with um, is actually uh, consistent as well, right? And and that's the you know the, the sort of capabilities that you're looking at, whether you're whatever trying to chart something to be able to look at the details, or you know uh, go from um, you know a a view of logs to the related traces. You you sort of want to make sure that um, you know the the information that's being served up there is consistent, right? And that in turn relies on um, data coming in uh, in a way that uh, is a sort of you know. 
uh, processed to, to be you know correlated well so that if you say hey um, you know I'm, I'm looking at a particular service I want to understand what uh, infrastructure it's sitting on or I'm looking at a log uh, and um, I see that uh, it relates to a particular service and I want to look at traces for that service those things need to um, be uh, kind of related from the data on in and that needs to be exposed to the user so they can navigate it properly and make use of it um, you know whether that's during kind of you know wartime uh, you know during during an incident or, or peacetime. Yeah, I love that wartime conciliary versus, you know, peacetime, you know, I saw a blog post from a VC, I think it said, don't be a Tom Hagen, which is the guy in The Godfather when the famous line said, don't, you're not a wartime conciliary, which means things are uncertain in these, these times and you've got to get them to be certain. This is a mindset and this is part of the, the, the pandemic we're living in. Um, great point, I love that. I love, maybe we can follow up on that at the end. But I want to get some of these topics I want to get your reaction to. So I want you to react to the following, Patrick. It's an issue and a topic, uh, and there it is. Missing data results in limited analytics and misguided troubleshooting. What's your reaction to that? What's your take on that? What's the Splunk's take on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think Splunk uh, has uh, has sort of um, been been a proponent of of that view uh, for a very uh, long time, right? I, I think that uh, you know whether that's from the log data or from let's say the the, the metric data that um, you know we we capture at high resolution uh, or from uh, tracing, right? Uh, the 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 goal here is to have uh, the data that you need in order to actually uh, properly diagnose uh, what's going on, right? And I and I think that uh, older approach especially on uh, the application side, uh, tend to um, uh, sample data right at the source um, and uh, provide, you know, uh, hopefully uh, useful samples uh, of it uh, for, you know, when you have that problem, right? Um, that doesn't work very well uh, in, uh, in the microservice world uh, because you need to actually be able to see the entirety of a, of a, a transaction, a full trace across many, many uh, services before you could uh, possibly make a decision as to what's useful to keep, right? Um, and so the approach that I think uh, we we believe is the right one is to be able to uh, capture at full fidelity, right? Um, all all of those uh, bits of information, um, partly because uh, of what I just said, right? You want to be able to find uh, the the right sample, but also because it's important to be able to tie it uh, to um, to something that may be being pulled in by a different system, right? So an example of that might be um, in in a case where uh, you are trying to do real user monitoring um, alongside of, of APM and you want to see the end-to-end -end trace from what the user sees all the way through to all the backend services, right? And, and so um, what's typical uh, in this world today is that uh, that information um, is being captured by two different systems uh, with making, you know, uh, independent sampling decisions, right? And therefore the ability to draw um, a straight line from what the end user sees all the way to what uh, is affecting it on the back end um, is pretty hard, right? Or it gets really expensive. Um, and I think the, uh, the approach that we've taken is to make it so that that's easy and, and cost effective, right? Um, and, and it's uh, tremendously helpful then, you know, to tie it back to kind of what we were talking about uh, at, the, at the outset here, uh, where uh, you, um, you know, you were trying to uh, provide services that make sense and are easy to access and so on to your end user uh, to be able to have that end-to-end -end view uh, because uh, you're not missing data, right? It's tremendously valuable. You know what I love about Splunk is because I'm a data geek going back when it wasn't fashionable back in the 80s. Um, uh, and, uh, Splunk has always been about ingesting all the data. So bring all the data, we'll take it all. You know, from, and, and at the beginning it was pretty straightforward, I mean, complex, but still that had a great utility. But even now today, it's the same theme you just mentioned, ingest all the data because there's now benefits. Um, and I want to just double ask you a quick question on this distributed computing trend, because I mean, everyone's pretty much in agreement that's in computer science or in the industry and, and technology says, okay, cloud is a distributed computing with the edge, it's essentially distributed computing in a new way, new architecture with new great benefits, new things, but science is still, you can apply some science there. You mentioned distributed tracing because at the end of the day, that's also a new major thing that you guys are focused on. And it's not so much about, it's also, yeah, it gets me all the data, but distributed tracing is a lot harder than to understand that because of the environment. Yeah. It's changing so fast. What's your take on it? Yeah. Yeah, well, fundamentally, I, I think this goes back to, uh, uh, ironically, one of the, the principles uh, in observability, right? Which is that uh, oftentimes you need participation from uh, the, the developers uh, in, in sort of uh, making sure that you have the right visibility, right? Um, uh, and it has to do with the fact that uh, there are um, many services uh, that are being 
uh, kind of strung together, as it were, to be able to deliver on some end user uh, transaction or some experience, right? Um, and so the fact that you have um, many services that are, are part of this um, means that you need to uh, make sure that each, each of those components is actually um, kind of uh, providing uh, some view uh, into what it's doing, right? Um, and and you know, distributed tracing is about taking that and and kind of weaving it together so that you get that coherent uh, view of the the business workflow uh, within the overall kind of web of of services that make up um, your your application, right? So the next topic I want to get into, we got you know, limited on time, but I'm going to squeeze through it. But I'm going to read it to you real quick. Slow alerts and insights are difficult to scale. Um, if, you, if they're difficult to scale, it holds back the mean time between resolving, okay? And yeah. so it's difficult to detect in cloud. It was easier maybe on premise, but with cloud, this is another complexity thing. How are you seeing the inability to scale quickly across the environments uh, for, to, to manage the performance issues and, and delays that are coming out of not having that kind of in slow insights or, or managing that? What's your reaction to that? Yeah, well, I, I think you know there there are a lot of uh, tools out there that you know will take in uh, events or, or issues from from cloud environments, but they're not designed from the very beginning uh, to be able to handle the uh, the sort of um, uh, scale uh, of what you're looking at, right? So I, I mentioned you know it's not uncommon uh, for for a company to have you know tens or maybe even hundreds of services and thousands of of containers or, or hosts, right? Um, and so the sort of sheer uh, amount of data you have to be looking at on an ongoing basis uh, and the fact that uh, things can change very quickly right uh, containers can you know pop in uh, and go away within within seconds right and so the the uh, the ability to track that in, in real time uh, implies that you need to have an architectural approach uh, that is built for uh, that from the very beginning right it's hard to retrofit um, a system to be able to handle orders of magnitude more complexity and and change and pace of change um, uh, you know you need to to start from the very beginning, right? And, and, and the belief we have is that you need um, some form of a real-time streaming architecture, right? Something that's capable of providing uh, that real-time uh, detection uh, and alerting um, uh, across a very wide range uh, of things um, in order to handle uh, the scale and the uh, ephemeral nature uh, of cloud environments, right? Well, let me ask you a question um, then, because and, I heard some people say, well, it doesn't matter, you know, 10, 15 minutes to log on a, an event is good enough. Uh, what would you react yeah, to that? Well, what give me an example of where it's not good enough? I mean, I mean, some well, minutes, I, I, or, is it minutes? <laughs> is it seconds? What are we talking about here? What's the good enough bar right now? You know. Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, any anybody who uh, has tried to deliver uh, uh, an experience digitally to an end user, uh, if you think uh, you can wait minutes uh, to solve the problem, uh, you know, you clearly haven't been paying enough attention, yeah, right? Yeah. Um, I and and I think that um, you know. Uh, it, I think it almost goes without saying that the faster you know uh, that you have a problem, uh, the better off uh, you are, right? Um, and and uh, and and so uh, you know when you think about you know what are the um, you know objectives that you have for your your service levels or your performance or availability, um, I think you know you run out of minutes pretty quickly if you get to anything like a you know say three nines, right? Uh, so you know waiting waiting 15 minutes uh, maybe would have been acceptable before people were really uh, trying to use your service at scale. Right? Yeah, and the latency uh, of the app requires it. It's super important. I I brought that up in tongue in cheek, kind of tee that up for you because yeah. you know these streaming analytics, yeah. streaming <laughs> engines are super valuable and knowing when to use real time and not also matters, right? This is where the platforms come in. Yes, absolutely. The, the, the platform is the thing that enables that, right? Um, and, and I think you have to sort of build it uh, from the very beginning uh, with that streaming approach, uh, with the ability to do um, analytics against the streams coming in, uh, in order for you to deliver on uh, the sort of promise of, uh, you know, alerts uh, and insights uh, at scale and in real time. All right, final point, I'll give you uh, the last word here. Give a plug for the Splunk observability suite. Um, what is it, why is it important? Why should people buy it? Why should people adopt it? Why should they upgrade to it? Give the perspective, give the, give the plug. Yeah, sure. Appreciate the uh, the opportunity. So I, I think as as we've been out there uh, speaking to customers, right, over um, you know uh, over the last year as part of Splunk and uh, before that, um, I, I think they've spoken to us a lot about the need uh, for for better uh, visibility uh, into uh, the, their their environments, right, which are um, increasingly complex um, and and where you know they're trying to deliver on the best possible uh, user experience uh, and to sort of add to that uh, where they're trying to actually consolidate. 
uh, the tools, right? We spoke about the sprawl um, at the beginning. Um, and so with what we're putting together here with the Splunk observability suite, um, I'd, I'd say we have uh, the industry's most comprehensive and powerful combination um, of solutions that will help uh, both sort of IT and DevOps teams tackle uh, these new challenges for monitoring and observability um, that other tools uh, simply can't address, right? So you're able to eliminate the management complexity by having a single uh, consistent user experience, right? Across uh, the metrics and logs and traces so that you can have seamless monitoring and troubleshooting and investigation, right? You can create uh, better user experiences uh, by having that true end-to-end -end, uh, visibility all the way from uh, the front end uh, to the back end services um, uh, so that you can actually see like what kind of uh, impact you're having uh, on users, right? And, and uh, figure it out uh, within, within seconds. Uh, I think we're also able to help um, increase developer productivity, right? With, with these high performance uh, tools that help the DevOps teams um, get to uh, better uh, quality code faster, right? Uh, because they can get immediate feedback on how uh, their, uh, their code chains are doing uh, with each, uh, with each, uh, each release, right? They, and they're able to operate more efficiently, right? So, so I think there's a, a very large number of benefits uh, from, from this approach of uh, providing a single unified tool set uh, that relies on um, a source of data that's consistent across it, but then has um, uh, the, the sort of uh, particular tools that different users need uh, for uh, what they, uh, they care about, whether you're the front end developer uh, needing to understand the, uh, the user uh, experience, whether you're back end service uh, owner uh, wanting to see how your service relates to others, whether you're owning the infrastructure and need to see, you know, is it actually providing uh, what these services uh, running on it need. Well, Patrick, great to see you. And I just want to say congratulations. I've been following your work going back uh, in the industry, specifically with SignalFX. You guys were really early in seeing the value of observability before it was a category. And so how it's morphed and so relevant as you guys had saw it. So congratulations and uh, keep up the great work. Keep, we'll keep the conversations open. Thanks for coming on. Great. Thanks so much, John. Great talking right, to you. All right, this is theCUBE. Leading with observability, it's a series, check it out. Uh, we have multiple talk tracks, check out the Splunk's uh, series, Leading with Observability. I'm John Furrier with theCUBE, thanks for watching. Mm -hmm.